This episode and every episode of the Beer Guys Radio Show is brought to you by Ironmonger Brewing. Visit Ironmonger at their tap room in Marietta, Georgia, or online at ironmongerbrewing.com. Open up a tab, grab a seat, and pour a pint. It's time for the Beer Guys Radio Show. You want free beer? Go to the brewery. Dedicated to the art, science, and enjoyment of craft beer. Yeah, what's wrong with the beer we got? Now, here are your hosts, Tim Dennis and Brian Hewitt. And welcome to the Beer Guys Radio Show. We are broadcasting from the Beer Guys Radio Studios in Marietta, Georgia. And this week, we're talking with Greeley, Colorado's Weldworks Brewing. With me, as always, is the man who is looking to start a hop farm in his beard, Brian Hewitt. And it's going well. I've heard that it takes a couple of years for the hops to really First develop. year, they yeah. never come out that It's just well. mostly just vines or vines. Next year, Brian. Yes. Next year. So hi, Tim. And uh, joining us today, we have Neil Fisher, the co-owner and head brewer of Weldworks Brewing, and Jake Goodman, the director of sales and marketing, also from Weldworks Brewing. We're going to talk about the Weldworks Invitational, New England IPAs, aggressive beer release schedules, and much, much more, Tim. Neil and Jake, thank you guys for joining us. Thanks for having yeah, us. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. Guys, we have just got into your double dry hopped juicy bits here. Can you tell us a little about this beer? So that one is one we only do about once a quarter, kind of a double dry hop take on our flagship IPA juicy bits. It's a lot of fun to make, mainly because we it was the first time we really started pushing hop limits and hop ratios well above our normal kind of three to five pounds was kind of the the limit for a while for us. And this one was the first time we really kind of forayed into that seven to 10 pound range that seemed excessive when we were opening, but now we've seen that it produces a, a totally diff- distinct experience. So Citra, Mosaic, Eldorado hops, same as Juicy Bits, uh, around seven pounds per barrel total. Just a really fun kind of showcase of uh, the hops that are most important to most of our lineup because we're selecting them for Juicy Bits. So this one features, I believe, our 2018 Citra and our 2018 El Dorado, our mosaic, we're still uh, getting ready to start using here in the next month or two. Well, it's delicious. I'm I, enjoying yeah. it quite a lot. I was going to say, I can tell you something about it. It's great. I, yeah. I love it. And we're going to yeah. get into a lot more Juicy Bits talk here sure. as we get into the show. So, Brian, how was your week, sir? Uh, it was eventful. It was busy. I uh, started started off with a doubling down on the Contrast Artisan. I went back over there because... Okay. We had them on last week yeah. and you had to go go visit, right? Uh, they're kind of in my neighborhood. It's kind of the okay. area I hang out with that's in Shambly, Georgia. And, uh, you know, had their Bossy Blonde, which I hadn't had before. And uh, the Luminiferous, which they just released. And, of course, the coffee... Biggie Hypnotized Stout. Uh, hypnotized Stout? Biggie hypnotized stout? Biggie Coffee. And, and I Hypnotized Biggie Coffee as yes, well. Yes, yes. Ex- uh, yes, exactly. So I did that and, uh, you know, made the made the rounds, went over to New Realm and uh, checked out their Oaxaca Chaka, went over there specifically for that and had some food while we were there and uh, got to try their uh, rendition of the Resilience IPA that was the Sierra Nevada right, charitable right, deal. Yeah. That was that was fun. If I see it, I have to buy it. I, I feel like I have to. We've talked about it enough on the air that if I didn't buy it, I'd be, you know. I don't You're know. doing your part to try every version of it made, I'm right? I'm trying. I'm only up to like three or four at this okay. point. Neil, but. did you guys do the resilience? Did you brew a version of that? You know, we didn't. The uh, not, not because of anything more than that. We already had a bunch of uh, charitable nonprofit beers on the schedule at the time. We actually wrapped one up in North Carolina that is going to be uh, with, we did Charleston and breweries in North Carolina as well, Wilmington and Raleigh. Uh, we're having them out here. That was already on the schedule. We also did uh, one for a local nonprofit called Josh um, and then the house that beer built. So we had quite a few that kind of all lined up and not to say we won't do it in the future, but uh, it seemed like there were a lot of people on board with that project, which is so awesome. Much needed. Sure, project. Absolutely. Well, that's so. what we actually were a little careful in asking someone, you know, did they do it? Because I'm like, I don't, there's so many doing it now. I'm like, I don't want someone to feel like, you know, well, okay. no, we, well, they <laughs> didn't do one. Everybody like, else did. Well, but there's a lot of stuff going on. You guys are releasing 100 beers a year and that. The, the schedule gets kind of full there, doesn't it? Yeah, we had, uh, you know, we're, we're getting better at planning, which uh, comes with some uh, caveats. We used to, you know, be a couple weeks out so we could throw something in, but now we're trying to get a little bit further on our schedule just to make it easier on our staffing and sourcing ingredients. Just <laughs> overall, just rather than, hey, we're brewing this next week, it's here's a few weeks out, here's a few months out, and eventually, maybe one day, we'll have an annual release calendar. But um, as Jake can attest, that's that's a difficult challenge for Weldworks. 
Sure. And it's hard to do with the way trends change and hops and everything. You kind of go with what strikes your fancy at the time, right? Yep, absolutely. Yeah, good stuff. Well, what did you get into, Tim? Brian, I also went to Oaxaca Chaca, had that, and uh, I worked a lot on pronouncing that, getting that correctly. <laughs> <Did you>? <laughs> so <laughs> words have been tough for me the last couple of weeks. So, but that was delicious. I enjoyed that yeah, a lot. It's really nice. Ni- nice balance of the spice, really tasty. Uh, gets a little boozy as it warms, a little it boozy punch there. Yeah. So, uh, for the cooler temperatures, man, it it'll get you a little get bit you of heat warmed to it up, too. little little yeah. hot. Yes, absolutely. Uh, went to Pontoon Brewing. Their anniversary is this weekend. Actually, we got a little preview of some of their upcoming anniversary beers that they're going to release. They had uh, triple combustible pineapple, which they yep. did the combustible pineapple before that uh, really enjoyed. So they've got that one coming out. There's a brownie batter stout, and I think the sour red that we tried. I don't think that's coming out. This weekend, I think that's a future release. I think I saw just... something on Craft Cellar about it. I'm not 100 percent sure, okay. but they mentioned it, that, and it's called Dawn Moon, and it's a Flanders Red. Okay, so that may or may not be there. I'm not sure. It was mentioned in some text in Craft Cellar for tickets for the event. So I I hadn't seen the, and it it's not on Untapped yet. So I hadn't seen it. It's like, oh hey, that's what the name was. So yeah, was... Triple Floor is Lava. Also, Tri- and Triple yeah. Floor is Lava. That's right. What's the Triple Floor is Lava? Was that Guava? There's like three fruits in that, I think right? It's, it's, it might be strawberry guava. I, I know strawberries in it, and it's a milkshake IPA, and I'm not 100% sure what's in it beyond that. Definitely lactose. Definitely it's lactose. Definitely, definitely yes. milky there. Absolutely. Yeah. Jake, how about you? Anything uh, big for you this week? Well, we just got back from the incredible Big Beers, Belgians, and Barley Wines Festival out in uh, Breckenridge Ooh. out here, which is is definitely a marquee event for us every year not just because of how industry heavy it is and uh my goodness the the poor list is just something to knock your socks off but beyond that it's actually kind of uh, ultimately i think the genesis of where weldworks really started so it's um kind of a special place for us to go back to every year and uh connect not just with each other as a team but also just to see all of our buddies that uh that we've also seen kind of growing up around us at the same time so I had a, uh, a more amazing beers than than I can count. The ones that stood out were definitely coming from Side Project, um, Anabasis, Batch Three, and uh, um, and then there was a huge um, Bourbon County tasting at one of the venues locally. So um, got got some tastes of some Bourbon County old Bourbon County beers that I'd never had a chance to try previously. Interesting, you know, Tim. I think it is time for the beers of the week. Crack open a cold one. It's the Truck and Tap Beer of the Week. <laughs> Craft beer and food trucks in downtown Woodstock. Truckandtap.com. Well, Brian, as always, we've got a good selection. We did a little pregame, and today we had Creature Comforts Pineapple Lemon Tritonia, uh, which is a nice uh, Goza beer. There we got in Sierra Nevada's Resilience Indeed. on your quest to try them all. We are definitely, Brian, going to get into and are into actually some Weldworks beers. We have the Double Dry Hop Juicy Bits, as we mentioned. Uh, we also have their Barrel Age Media Noche Stout that we'll get into a little bit later. That's exciting. It is exciting. So, Brian, what's happening in this week's news? What's in the news? The beer guys have the scoop. Extra, extra, read all about it. Time for headlines. All right, so there's a lot of craft beer government shutdown chatter in the news. You've probably seen it. For a lot of the stories, it's the same basic details, but I've come across a few interesting and unexpected developments. For example, Yellowhammer Brewing in Huntsville, Alabama, is running out of beer, and they're blaming the partial government shutdown for it. And it's not because of new beer labels not being approved. It's because the shutdown has slowed down customs, and Yellowhammer gets their cans from Mexico. And as a result, that has slowed their uh, receiving of the cans to like 20 days at this point and they say switching suppliers at this stage would mean even more we need those reusable bottles like they have in uh in is it belgium or germany that's right it's it's germany where you you would be set man we also have atlas brewing works in washington dc suing the acting u.s attorney general over their inability to sell labeled beer during the partial government shutdown they're claiming that this represents a violation of their first amendment rights tim of course this is because the ttb new label approval process is closed during the shutdown and according to the lawsuit they have 40 barrels of a new beer that is just sitting there in tanks since January 3rd, and uh, it's going to expire. The TTB shutdown is impacting me, too, because I look at that for the new releases coming up, and it's been like December 22nd, I think, was the last time they had uh, label yeah. approvals come through. 
this shutdown's got to end, man. It's uh, I don't know the new beers that are coming out. So I know it's it's it's, it's traumatic crazy. for us. <laughs> well, you're listening to the Beer Guys Radio Show. We do need to take a break, but we'll be back very soon to talk to Weldworks Brewing. And then it's love that'll grip you by the heart. You may feel your ego start to fall apart. But then all that's left. It's Brian and Tim, the beer guys. If you're like us, no lunch or dinner is complete without a pint or two of craft beer. Which is why Truck and Tap in downtown Woodstock, Alpharetta, and Duluth are always on our list. Tim, why do they call it Truck and Tap? Well, the tap part is easy, Brian. They've got 18 of them. As for the truck part, that's where it gets interesting. Truck and Tap features your favorite Atlanta area food trucks, so you're getting a different menu every day. Truck and Tap in downtown Woodstock, Alpharetta, and Duluth. Truckandtap.com. Let them know that the beer guys sent you. Craft beer forged with a reverence for tradition and new styles that start a revolution. Ironmonger Brewing. The brewers at Ironmonger Brewing pride themselves at being masters of barrel-aged, hoppy, and sour beers. They invite you to their tap room in Marietta, Georgia to taste and see. Also visit their barrel room for an intimate drinking experience with great live entertainment. Keep up to date on all things Ironmonger by liking them on Facebook. Ironmonger Brewing, establishing a new standard in craft beer. The Beer Guys on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Cannibal! Cannibal coming. Now, back to the Beer Guys Radio Show. Welcome back to the Beer Guys Radio Show. If you miss an episode, don't worry. All episodes are available as a podcast. Subscribe on your favorite podcasting app and never miss a show. We're talking with Neil Fisher and Jake Goodman from Weldworks Brewing. Gents, thanks once again for joining us. We really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedules to chat with us this evening. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. Well, you know, something we always like to ask our guest is kind of how they got their start in brewing. And we did a little research and you guys seem like your story is is similar to a lot. Kind of guys hanging out, having a good time in the garage, brewing some beers. Is that correct? Yeah, that's that's um, as Jay kind of mentioned earlier, we what really prompted opening World Works is winning medals at the homebrew competition up at Big Beers. Um, myself and my uh, partner, Colin Jones. Uh, we're both part of this informal homebrew club that kind of hung out in my garage, just brewing beer once a month. And that's kind of where we met. It was really more of a, uh, I, w- I wouldn't even call it a club. It was way less formal than that, but people that would go to breweries together, do tours, uh, events, festivals, and then brew. And then that was kind of where everything started. So kind of a, uh, a beer drinkers or homebrewer social club. It sounds like you do a little bit of everything and make the rounds and then, uh, you know, when things start really working for you, winning awards, you're like, hey, we got to make this into a, we need to make this into a permanent gig, right? Start getting serious yeah. about it. Absolutely. Now, you guys have had uh, amazing growth since you opened, and I believe you just actually purchased the land that your brewery's on in preparation for a big expansion, correct? This happened way sooner than we imagined, but um, it's always been our goal was to to purchase the property rather than just continue to, to lease. Our landlords were amazing and um nothing born out of, oh, we need to get out from under them, but more just being able to control our own destiny and uh, and make sure that we can build infrastructures that are permanent and allow us to stay in Greeley uh, as long as, as we want to. And so that was a big goal of ours. And to be able to realize that less than four years after we opened was, I mean, it's that's probably one of the most surreal feelings we've experienced in ownership and, and kind of the whole trajectory of the brewery to go from, you know, leasing a about 6,000 square feet, a little bit more to now owning um, over 20,000 square feet of, of three different buildings and parking is essentially an entire city block. We're just really thankful that we're in that position. That's we've got a lot of our breweries here a little tight on parking. Yes. Got to get where you can and get in there and get your beer. But, you know, I remember seeing the announcement that you made on Facebook and even the Facebook post, you could just sense the excitement there, you know, for it. And that's always cool to see people excited. It wasn't just a a press release or an announcement, kind of the the emotion of the excitement uh, for the growth there was obvious even in the Facebook post. Yeah, absolutely. I think our community, they've obviously been aware of just our growth and and kind of setting up a tent pole saying this is, you know, where we're going to be. So to acquire the property is, I think it goes even further to say like, we're here and we're here to stay and we're going to invest as much as we can into this community. I think that's something that, you know, we love making great beer. We love all the things we get to do because of that. But being able to to really invest in our community and and be a part of change and a part of growth for our city in particular, 
you know, for people that don't live in Colorado, they don't really have this, the best understanding of what the challenges we face. Um, we're, you know, an hour outside of Denver. So not near, you know, a lot of the main growth that's happened in the last decade or two in Colorado. Um, but that's changed very rapidly. And so we're just really excited to be a part of that, that story and that history for Greeley going forward. So having all that real estate must mean that you have kind of a, the area on lock for holding your Weldworks Invitational, right? I mean, that's got to help the parking and having all the event space. Could, tell us about the uh, Weldworks Invitational. Yeah, we uh, we were had been talking about hosting our own festival for, for years, even really before the brewery. I think um, it was a dream that grew out of our, our local Oktoberfest. Um, I had been a part of that. My wife uh, is now the executive director at the Greeley Downtown Development Authority. So their Oktoberfest event was the biggest kind of beer-centric event we had in Greeley. Um, but it was you know, not necessarily geared just towards the beer. It was a, a bigger experience than that. And we'd always talked about what if we could host something, you know, not like GBF, but but something that was really just focused on on beer. We have such great beer festivals in Colorado, like uh, like we've mentioned earlier, big beers up in Breckenridge this past weekend. Obviously, the Great American Beer Festival. Um, there's no shortage of good events, but we really wanted to bring that kind of experience to Greeley. So even you know, without Weldworks being a part of that conversation, that's a dream a lot of us have had here in Greeley. Um, and so when we were in the position we could we could invite people and they'd actually show up, uh, especially brewers, that was kind of the first step. We kind of used our, our gold medal at GABF uh, in 2017 with Medianoche. We used that kind of as a launching platform. What if we built a festival around this idea that all the people that make a similar style, you know, barrel-aged imperial stout and other barrel-aged beers, we want to reach out to them and say, hey, would you guys ever consider coming to Greeley and, and pouring at a festival? And kind of those initial email inquiries were resounding yeses that we'd never expected from uh, some of the best breweries uh, in the world. And so that really, for us, was the culmination of a dream for a lot of us. That, and, and that happened in June. So now it's uh, with us owning the property, being able to just continue things at the brewery, the hotel that's uh, where we host the venue is only five blocks away, four blocks away. They've you know already signed the contract with us. So uh, it just means that we're going to be able to continue doing that for the foreseeable future. And that was something I, I was looking at the brewery list there, and you were what three years old, I guess, when you threw your your first festival this year or last year, I guess. Yeah, not not yeah, just over three years, um, and and it wasn't you know it wasn't even on our anywhere in our planning for the first five years of opening. Hey, we should host a, an invitational. We were obviously inspired by breweries like Firestone Walker, who've you know really made the Firestone Walker Invitational one of the premier beer events in the country. Um, so that was always, you know, on the, like, oh, that would be so cool if we could do something like that, but never really something we thought was possible. Um, so to, to see that happen this past June and, and also to see the response, not just to host it and do it, but to do it so well and to have such good feedback um, that we just don't anticipate that tickets will, will be a tough sell this year. I think people, right, we, yeah. had, we had to prove ourselves for sure. Get them while you can when they when they launch there. Yeah, I think we really wanted to try and also create a an atmosphere, kind of a two headed thing. It's it's uh, yes, of course, it's for uh, to bring everyone around and, and sample all this amazing liquid from around the country. But we've also been exposed to some of the best hospitality uh, that we've ever experienced via other breweries inviting us to their festivals, like the Forever Summer Fest at the Vale and uh, Burn Pile over at Burial, um, you know, Firestone Walker, of course. And right. these folks who who uh, just embody the collaborative spirit of the entire industry. And we just kind of wanted to create a place where everyone could also have that side of it as well, where uh, we could all hang out and bounce ideas off each other and high five and kind of enjoy that that camaraderie, that congenial side of this industry at, at the same time. Absolutely. I mean, beer people, it's always a good time to hang out, you know, talk shop, have some fun. Beer festival is a good time. And again, like you said, it was a, a pretty all-star list that you had together there. And you had some of our, uh, our cool Georgia brewers there yes. too. That's, I know you had John Sherry from little cottage. We'd mentioned that a little bit before we started recording. So how did you guys run into John Sherry? how did you guys meet him? Yeah, to be honest, he connected uh, with one of our at now former brewers, uh, Nick uh, Armitage, who actually just left us to take on a head brewer position not far. Um, but he, I think, established a relationship with with John. And um, hey, we were looking for a couple people to fill in with our lineup. We we weren't sure exactly how much space we had at the venue. And once that kind of became finalized, um, I think they had connected 
sent some beer out, we tasted it. And, and that was really an example of how, you know, the beer itself can just, can just be enough. You know, there are obviously sure, right. not a lot of people that are aware of, of little cottage, but we taste and, and this, yeah, this is fantastic beer. It would be really cool to, to have it here at our festival. I think that's what we're always, you know, going to continue to do with this festival. There's going to be some big names that everyone's aware of. Um, but we're also not just looking at co- like cultivating this list of, of hype, you know, breweries that are, you know, everyone's waiting lines for that's a lot of that's merited, but we also want to see who's the next world works, you know, who there's a lot of breweries that, that believed in us well before uh, we had any sort of name associated with our brand. And uh, we're just excited to see who that next crop is and, and new breweries opening all the time. There's it's, it's getting tougher and tougher to open a new brewery, but it doesn't mean that the people that are opening right now aren't capable of making world-class beer right out the gate. So we want to be connected with those people and continue to maintain that. So that's kind of how that fostered. And, um, and we're just can, you know, going to look at our list. We haven't finalized everything, but we're trying to do the same thing every year, bring in new people, new ideas and new um, exposure to especially Colorado. A lot of our attendees are from Colorado and have probably never heard of half these breweries. So you listen to the beer guys radio show. We do need to take a break, but we'll be back very soon to talk more with Weldworks Brewing. Take a deep breath, brother. You can from a loving mother. Lose the fallacy and go fear. You'll feel her love. We are Reformation Brewery, celebrating the reformer in you. Locally crafted within the renowned Etowa watershed of Woodstock, Georgia, Reformation creates yeast forward brews full of aroma and flavor crafted to last. Come see us in beautiful Woodstock, Georgia, for a tour and tasting of unique brews that you can't find anywhere else. Reformation Brewery. Set beer free. ReformationBrewery.com Are you thinking about opening a brewery in the Atlanta area? If so, take a look at the park at Georgetown. This unique community will feature a collection of restaurants as well as a craft brewery within the new JW Homes luxury development, Dunwoody Green. Conveniently located less than half a mile from I-285, this enclave of restaurants will be the gathering place in Dunwoody. Krim & Associates, the developer of the park at Georgetown, wants to talk to you. For more information, call Todd Semrau at 404-226-6526. Follow the Beer Guys on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Next Friday is Hawaiian Shirt Day. So, you know, if you want to, go ahead and uh, wear a Hawaiian shirt and jeans. Now, back to the Beer Guys Radio Show. Welcome back to the Beer Guys Radio Show. I want to give a quick shout out to one of our great radio affiliates, WSLA 1560 AM in Slidell, Louisiana. Catch Beer Guys Radio on WSLA every Saturday at 8 AM Central. Now let's hear more about Weldworks Brewing. Guys, I did want to cover a couple little pieces about the Invitational before we, we move on here. So this was something you did to support charitable causes as well, correct? Yes. Yeah, that was um, that was kind of the... <laughs> That was the benefit of, of throwing a big party was one, getting all these people together, but also to try and help raise funds for local nonprofits. And I think I saw that you uh, are going to disperse a little over $40,000 to charitable causes in the area. Is that correct? Yeah, we, we were uh, excited to announce that we are going to be funding six different nonprofits. Uh, is that correct, Jake? I think six mm-hmm. at uh, $40,000 total. Yes, sir. What, what are those nonprofits out of curiosity? We've got the uh, Immigrant and Refugee Center of Northern Colorado. Uh, we have uh, the United Way of Weld County. Uh, we have a women's place. We have the Greeley Transitional House. We have, we're the last two I'm missing, Neil. I won't hold you to the exact so names. Brian but put you on the line shirt. there. I, yeah, Be ready. <laughs> you should have had a laundry list. I was, list I was there, okay so. with a few exactly. We didn't have to do yeah. the entire list. Let's but. So uh, how's planning going for the uh, 2019 edition of the Invitational? Vigorous. Really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Vigorous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Jake, uh, Jake's probably underselling a little bit, but we we finally are, are in the depths of 2019 planning. Um, we feel a little bit more confident going into this year, um, which I think has given us at least we know what we what the goal is, is to do what we did last year, just a little bit better. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. We're not trying, Hey, how's this going to go? Um, 
but fortunately we we've got our planning committee meetings already started and we've got a pretty awesome team behind it again uh, we we're still finalizing those lists we're hoping that tickets are available starting next month um, we just have to figure out exactly who's coming um, and also finalize space details we're working on some more lodging the hotel that we host the venue at is, is going to be full very quickly so um, all those things we're hoping to to roll out by end of february for sure now talking of beer fest one more beer fest related question and then we'll we'll quit talking beer fest but you had mentioned earlier that you're hitting other festivals kind of outside of colorado i know you were at the the one in chicago you're going down to hunapu's day but that's a goal for you is to kind of expand your exposure by hitting some festivals outside of kind of your backyard correct absolutely jake is that is that is that a true statement yeah, a hundred percent. It's uh, and again, some of it goes back to just the camaraderie thing. Um, it's just great to go and, and visit all of these folks and see what what they have going on, see how they do it. I mean, and I mean everything. See how the how the back of the house works. See how um, how their tap rooms function. What their culture is like. It's it's just a lot to learn from a lot of people who have been doing it uh, for longer than us. But beyond that, you know, we would like a national presence as well. Um, we, we'd like to have beer out to places. Uh, that aren't just Colorado, you know, we'll never be probably ever consistently distributing outside of this state, but uh, um, we do want to make sure that we get the brew into the hands of people who are, are kind enough to be requesting it. And, uh, and honestly, they're just really fun. <laughs> they're just a blast. To, That's to yeah. Do. You know, I, I saw that when, when I saw Jake, your, your spin on it, uh, on the info you sent me, it's like, more exposure by attending festivals outside of Colorado. I'm like, this is just an excuse to go hang out in cool places with cool it's people. It's a boondoggle. So, yeah. Yes. But, so, but it's, it, and you can call it work. So it works out for everybody, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. One, one of the perks of the gig. Yeah, for sure. Well, it's definitely, you know, been successful in getting your name out there. And, uh, you know, I, I I was reading up on you guys uh, in preparation for this, and I saw that you won the uh, the best new brewery in 2016. I mean, how much of an impact did that have on your business? Which was I w- actually the question should be, which is bigger, being named the best new brewery in 2016 by USA Today, or or winning that gold medal? Oh man, those I think those both will be you know as we look back in a few years, those will both be markers that say, oh, this is what defined kind of some explosive growth in certain years. USA Today was, was a big one for us that, um, and that was really led by our followers, our fans, our, our customers, because we're at the time, uh, we, you know, going up against breweries like Rheingeist, um, who were big fans of, um, but they were way more established and, and had a much bigger kind of presence than we did. So it was totally a grassroots kind of a, way for us to get our name out there and surprisingly we we were able to kind of take that that title for usa today and that also happened it was all it's just kind of you know a perfect storm that happened the same time we released made noche for the same for the first time um so it was right around our one year anniversary um and then also is when we introduced juicy bits which was meant to be our our one year anniversary one-off it was hey here's a new england style ipa we're, we're gonna make it once uh and now we're you know well over probably close to 200 batches in um, and that beer hasn't gone any gone away. So all those things happen at the same time. Um, and then the, the medal at um, with Midi Noche uh, it, that was our first gold medal at, at one of the major competitions. And, and it was, it was probably more gratifying for our staff and, and our brewers and, and kind of us than it necessarily was for, it made a big difference in the business. Um, but I think we, we just take such a unique approach to that beer. I know you guys, um, are hopefully drinking that now. Um, we are indeed. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And we feel, we feel so, so rebellious because this is a 14.2%, which is above Georgia state limit, Neil. So we're, Shh, we're getting crazy don't, over here today. Don't tell we put yeah, bars we, on the door. Yeah, all right. <laughs> Yeah, don't don't let anyone know you're drinking contraband beer. No, we'll keep <laughs> um, keep it down. Keep it down. But that's a beer that uh, we're we're really proud of it, and it's um, it's one that's you know it's continued to evolve a little bit, but it's mostly stayed true to the ethos of um, just this idea that that you can make a beer that on paper should never you should never make it regularly. It should not be something you do um, with frequency because it's expensive, it's time consuming. We boil this beer now for um, thirty. 
about 30 to 4, 34 hours uh, continuously. The boss uh, is 36. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's, See? It's, we've we've moved from yeah, but it used to be overnight, twenty four hours. Now it's it's pushing thirty six, and eventually we'll probably hit forty because we can just figure out how to be more effective with with actual brood time, and then we're just waiting for it to boil. Um, so it's a continuous boil that is over a day, usually closer to two days. Um, and we just have found that the the way we brew it is just what makes this beer so unique. Um, we we design the beer around the barrel. Um, so winning that medal was not just, you know, it was, it was certainly satisfying and it was, you know, but it, it said that there's something unique about this from all the, you know, 170, 180 entries in this category. Um, and, and some of those things you can't fake, you can't speed up, you can't expedite. Um, and it just takes time and patience. So we, we love having fun with all styles. You know, we do a lot of fun adjuncts, um, but just the straight base beer is something we've spent a lot of time just trying to figure out how to make it the best possible expression of both the stout and the barrel that it ages in. And that's kind of where we landed. So um, that's been, I think, really fun for us to, to now we have a metal behind it. It doesn't change the way we make it. In fact, it probably reinforces bad bad uh techniques of i spent the night yeah spend the night at the brewery on monday night because we've been having boiler issues and we were brewing midi noche so i was like well i think i'm just gonna stay here all night we'll make sure the boiler's running and that's that's that so gotta do it again well that's that's something boil times are a hot topic in georgia right now so the stouts here are judged based on their boil time and i believe i think jason pellet from orpheus brewing mentioned i think he was next to you guys at gabf and I believe you had some conversations there about your boil times. So yeah. he shares a lot of the same uh, the same thoughts there. Uh, yeah, we we time. only we only, at the uh, festival, Jake. We only got to try some of the the sour beers, but then uh, afterwards, I think we tried some stouts, and we are big fans of Orpheus and what they're doing there. It's it was fantastic. Uh, yeah, it was good stuff. Guys, we need to take another break. You're talking. Brian had a question. He'll get to that in a minute. You're listening to the Beer Guys Radio Show. We are going to take a break, but we will be right back to talk more with Weldworks Brewing. Craft beer forged with a reverence for tradition and new styles that start a revolution. Ironmonger Brewing. The brewers at Ironmonger Brewing pride themselves at being masters of barrel-aged, hoppy, and sour beers. They invite you to their tap room in Marietta, Georgia to taste and see. Also visit their barrel room for an intimate drinking experience with great live entertainment. Keep up to date on all things Ironmonger by liking them on Facebook. Ironmonger Brewing. Establishing a new standard in craft beer. Brian and Tim, the beer guys. If you're like us, no lunch or dinner is complete without a pint or two of craft beer. Which is why Truck and Tap in downtown Woodstock, Alpharetta, and Duluth are always on our list. Tim, why do they call it Truck and Tap? Well, the tap part is easy, Brian. They've got 18 of them. As for the truck part, that's where it gets interesting. Truck and Tap features your favorite Atlanta area food trucks, so you're getting a different menu every day. Truck and Tap in downtown Woodstock, Alpharetta, and Duluth. Truckandtap.com. Let them know that the beer guys sent you. guys on facebook twitter and instagram the numbers all go to 11 does that mean it's louder well it's one louder isn't it now back to the beer guys radio show Welcome back to the Beer Guys Radio Show. If you enjoy the show, please consider supporting us on Patreon. Just go to patreon.com slash beerguys. Patrons can get some cool perks like Beer Guys swag and commercial-free episodes. Now back to our conversation with Neil Fisher and Jake Goodman from Wellworks Brewing. Neil, I have a question for you. Something I saw recently is uh, that you're, you're a contributor to Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. I've seen you know some of the videos and articles you've done there. But one thing that you're taking part soon in uh, what they call the Craft Brewers retreat which looks really really cool can you tell us about that yeah so um this one is uh, windsor maine or booth harbor maine i think is june 9th through the 12th it's a pretty epic event the list just keeps growing i think they've they finally today announced the last uh brewer just a small guy yeah, out just of, a little guy uh, yeah i don't know if anybody knows him Vinny. have you heard um, of this guy <laughs> yeah 
And so for me personally to be uh, in that, I think there's now either nine, maybe uh, it's, it's a pretty much a, a dream list of brewers to um, if I, if this event was happening when I was uh, home brewing, it would have been a no brainer. Obviously, right. you know, there's, it's a premier event. Um, I've, I've had the, privilege of being a part of the event here in Colorado, never as a featured brewer. I, I didn't have the, uh, the credibility then, but now to be, you know, alongside people like that, um, people like Vinny, fill it perennial friends, you know, personal friends that, you know, other half Sam, um, and then just uh, a who's who of relevant brewers in, tw- in 2019. It's, it should be a lot of fun. I, I was excited about the news of any being added. Um, just personally, as, as somebody on that list, I'm like, oh, man, I can't wait to hang out with him. Um, so He just came over here and did a collaboration with Creature Comforts. So I that's saw that. cool yes. to see that yeah. coming out. Yeah, good stuff. But So the, the retreat, people go up there. They get to brew with you guys and, and drink some beer, eat good food, hang out with, with cool people. And I think once it's all said and done, they actually get some of the beer uh, packaged. Is that right? Yeah, the way we, I, I'm not sure exactly the logistics at uh, Maine, um, but in Colorado, you know, with the five featured brewers they were doing before that event um, moved on to Windsor or to Maine, um, they had a lot of, I think, I can't remember how many different days, usually at least two days of home brewing. And then those beers that are brewed. So every uh, featured brewer will s- contribute a recipe, they'll brew it while they're there. And then they'll go back. Uh, the craft beer and brewing folks will bottle it, package it, get it sent out um, back to the attendees. So really cool opportunity. I don't know how many people get to actually brew a beer with uh, like Jason Perkins. And uh, and then, you know, he, he contributes to the recipe. You get to brew alongside him and then get a bottle of that down the road. That's a pretty amazing experience. Pretty cool stuff. Yeah. That does sound really cool. You know, so I heard that you had a goal and I think this was for 2018. I'm not sure if it applies to 2019, but to release a new beer every week, was it really difficult to come up with a new recipe every week? And uh, how sustainable is that? We, we far surpassed our goal of a hundred, which was a little over two beers a week in 2018. I think we're dialing that back to one new beer a week uh, in 2019, which for us all, everyone's kind of breathing a sigh of relief, even at one new beer a week. But um, <laughs> it's like, oh man, that's that's so easy to do now. Uh, so that was really my goal was just <laughs> to push this way beyond what everyone thought we could do. And now one new beer a week doesn't seem unreasonable. But we we honestly, the creative side of that was not nearly as challenging as what Jake and the sales and, and distribution and logistics team, what they were faced with. We have so many talented creatives uh, at Worldworks. We have a, a group of people helping dial in recipes, decide what we're brewing. Not that that part's not difficult, but you know, a lot of us don't realize that once we come up with the recipe, that's only half the battle. It's coming up with the name and the branding, how we sell it, how we communicate all that. So Jake can probably touch a little bit on, on how that was presented in 2018. Jake, what was it like to, I believe you did in 2018, 137 beers. Is that correct? Yes, sir. So what was it like to have to uh, name and market 137 beers in a year? <laughs> uh, it was really, really fun, man. To, to, <laughs> there you go. Totally That's honest. the right answer. Uh, was that the word you were looking for? Yeah. <laughs> Super fun, actually, is what I was looking for. I, I mean, it's, uh, you know, we have a, uh, you know, when we first kind of started building up, um, building the, the team up where it wasn't just, you know, uh, a three or four people at the, at the brewery at all times, once there were some more folks underneath us um, and we're, we're starting to build a, a, a real group. I, I remember sitting around a, a table at one point and um, I think it was one of our early, early sales meetings when we actually had a sales team. And I remember Colin, uh, again, one of our owners saying, all right, raise your hand if you have done this before. And um, you know, nobody could raise their hand. And there is something about that that makes it that really does make it fun and does make it easier, uh, if, if that makes sense, because you don't really know what the limitations are or what they're supposed to be or what you're supposed to do or what what is expected or anything like that. You're just saying, I don't know. Let's let's throw it at the wall and see if it sticks. Um, so it was it was a massive learning experience. It was awesome to to see everyone in, in the back because, you know, yeah, we're doing a ton of one offs, but the amount of knowledge that that crew is gaining off of constantly making these new beers allows you to pull, you know, those small bits of information into the, the subsequent beers and continue, even though they might be one offs, a lot of them are really unbelievable and taste as though they have been dialed in over time, but that's just because uh, we we 
just had to keep going. You know, we, we made this promise early on that we were going to do a hundred and gosh, darn it. If we weren't going to get there. So, uh, it was, it was a challenge. We're going to do it one way or the other. This is happening. Exactly. Huh? exactly. Okay. And that's packaged too, right? Everything had, you know, packaged in cans. We're not talking just crowlers and, and, uh, and uh, uh, six tools and things like that. You're actually putting cans, the art and the names and everything like that in, in all of these hundred beers or 137 beers, as it turns out. Yeah. It was about a hundred that ended up um, being completely uh, named, uh, designed um, and packaged and sent out into the market. So yeah, uh, like, like Neil was saying, add a clip of about two, two brand new beers out to distribution every week. That see, that's impressive. I I did not yeah. figure they were packaged. If you were doing yep. that many beers, that's something. Well, guys, speaking of your beers, I think we'd uh, be doing an injustice here if we didn't talk a little bit more about Juicy Bits. Kind of your, your flagship beer, the New England IPA, which we see a lot of good ones out of of Colorado. You know, talking about the New England IPA and how that style is there, though. Each region has its own. We've got our West Coast IPA, our our Northeast IPA. Florida has a Florida Weiss. Is there a style? that is more Colorado? I think that's kind of the cool part about Colorado is that we have so many breweries. Um, you know, we've got <clears throat> close to 400 breweries in, in Colorado. We'll probably breach that this year. Um, and so everyone brings unique perspectives from different regions. And so part of the, I guess, the challenge is that we don't necessarily have a regional identity. We have the best of everyone, every region. For me, it was... You know, the best like Colorado IPA has always been Odell IPA, but it's it's like this perfect mix of West Coast and more East Coast uh, with a little bit, you know, it's not as dry, but it just is such a fantastic beer. And that, I think, really started to pave the way for something that's not just West Coast dry, palate wreckingly bitter IPA. You know, there's a lot of beers that fit in that kind of construct that um, Odell here in Colorado paved the way for. So we we benefit from so many unique perspectives that we kind of have this melting pot of awesome ideas. So Neil, you're a contributor to the craft beer and brewing, and you shared a recipe for Juicy Bits there. And a lot of breweries kind of guard the recipes jealously, especially for their most popular beer. Why did you decide to share that? You know, we've we've kind of always operated, not a, a sense of arrogance or pride, but out of a sense of confidence. It's not necessarily just about the recipe. It's about the way we, you know, the, the process, the equipment we use, um, sure. the techniques. And so publishing a recipe like Juicy Bits, if I had to do it all over again, I'd probably publish it sooner and not hold it any closer because we've, it, it really elevated our brand and our recognition on the, on the national level with that. And I, I stole that out of Vinny's playbook with Pliny the Elder, that beer being one of the most homebrewed recipes in all of American craft beer, you know, is a huge testament to what he had done and what he continues to do for our industry, which is produce an excellent beer tell everyone how you make it and then challenge homebrewers to try his version against theirs. Sure, sure, absolutely. And for our listeners, we'll include a link to the recipe when we post the episode on the website. So you want, might want to try your hand at making your own juicy bits. Get some juicy bits there. And right? then go out and buy a can absolutely. when you realize that yours when is you not quite as good. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, and check out Craft Beer and Brewing and all the other videos sure. and articles they have there because there's more from Neil and a lot of other folks there. Some really cool stuff there. Well, guys, we're about out of time here, but if folks want to follow along with what's going on at Weldworks Brewing, what is the best way to do that? Our uh, website, yeah, Facebook, yeah, Facebook, Instagram, um, in probably that order, Facebook, Instagram, and then our website. Excellent. Well, Jake, Neil, thanks so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Appreciate it, guys. Thanks for having us. Well, that wraps it up for this week's episode of the Beer Guys Radio Show. Coming up next week, we are prepping for the big game, Brian. Ooh. The Superb Owl. You should see was. the wingspan on that it's owl. A huge, it's yeah, huge. Yeah, you got to be careful what you huge. say involving this game. But we're going to be talking beers and bites for your big game watch mm. party, Brian. For more crapper info, follow us online. We are Beer Guys Radio on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thanks again for tuning in. Have a great week, and don't forget to drink local. Cheers. Cheers.